Our third speaker is Dr. Charlotte Oyston, who is also in the final year of her PhD, studying under the supervision of Professor Philip Baker. Charlotte studied medicine at the University of Otago, graduating with a BMed Sci Honours in 2003 and MBCHB in 2005. Charlotte then undertook training in obstetrics and gynaecology, developing a particular interest in how placental pathology <coughs> mediates fetal growth and outcomes. She interrupted her medical training to join the Liggins Institute for her doctoral studies. Charlotte will tell us about her exciting research into a potential novel therapy for the treatment of fetal growth restriction. Great, thanks Frank and good evening everybody. So one of my areas of research interest is fetal growth restriction and this is where during pregnancy the baby doesn't grow to its full genetic potential. This is a really important complication because these babies are much more vulnerable to serious complications around the time of their delivery, including breathing difficulties, brain injury, and even death. But we also know that the consequences of being born small don't end in the neonatal period, and as these children grow up, they're more likely to become obese, diabetic, and have high blood pressure. Despite all of these implications, we currently have no treatments that we can offer a woman in pregnancy to improve her baby's growth. And this also means that the most severely affected pregnancies are going to have to be delivered preterm in order to prevent stillbirth. This is not a satisfactory solution because then we have the consequences of prematurity compounding on those of growth restriction. <coughs> One important cause of growth restriction is reduced placental perfusion. And we know that in many of these pregnancies, the mother's blood vessels that supply the placenta don't undergo the same changes that they do in a normal pregnancy. So in a normal healthy pregnancy, the mother's blood vessels become physically larger and they dilate more, and this means that large amounts of blood are able to flow through and perfuse the placenta. But in many growth restricted pregnancies, the blood vessels stay narrow and constricted, and this means that less blood is able to flow and perfuse the placenta. So it's these sorts of differences which have led to the suggestion that substances that can dilate the uterine circulation may be good treatments for growth restriction. And sildenafil citrate, more commonly known as Viagra, <coughs> is one such possible candidate. So sildenafil is a potent vasodilator and we all know that it inc can increase the pelvic blood flow in males. But we hypothesise that when used by pregnant women, it will also increase the placental blood flow and result in increased fetal growth. There is now accumulating evidence that sildenafil can improve fetal growth, but much of the work done to date has been done in mice and rats. And there are two main gaps in our knowledge at the moment. Firstly, evidence of sildenafil's efficacy at improving growth in large animals is lacking. And in this case, it's really important to consider the large animals because mice and rats have very short pregnancies, whereas larger animals tend to have pregnancies more similar in length to humans. And if sildenafil works, and this is a treatment that we want to be able to offer women over a number of weeks, so we need to be able to study it over this time frame to ensure that it's continued to be, continued to be beneficial and that there's an absence of harm. We also don't have a clear understanding of the mechanisms through which sildenafil may improve fetal growth. Although we hypothesise that because it's a dilator, it's going to dilate the uterine arteries and increase blood flow. Having a clear understanding of the mechanism through which a treatment works is really important because this is what's going to help us to apply or use the treatment most effectively in the clinical situation. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to take you through three of my studies where we're trying to answer some of these questions. But first of all, we did a large study in mice, and the purpose of this study was to assess the effects of sildenafil not only on fetal growth, but on the dilation in the mother's uterine arteries. We used three strains of mice, the C57, they're our control strain. So in the absence of any other intervention, these mice have pregnancies which grow normally. Then we used two strains, the Enos and the Compt, which have growth-restricted babies. In addition, we wanted to do something to make sure that the pregnancies that we were studying were as growth restricted as possible. So to do this, we put half of the mothers in each strain on a high fat diet before and during pregnancy, because this is something that's known to be detrimental to fetal growth. Then just over halfway through the pregnancy, we put mothers, half of the mothers in each group on a sildenafil treatment. This is given via the drinking water, and the other half just remained on their standard drinking water. 
So this treatment lasted for six days and at the end of it we took measurements of the pups and assessed the mother's uterine artery function. So what did we see? Well, as expected, the most severely growth restricted pups in this study were from the mothers who were on a high fat diet. So this is the weights of their pups displayed in this graph here. When the mothers were treated with sildenafil, there was a significant increase in the weights of their pups. And we also saw a significant increase in the length of these pups and their girth. When we looked at the mother's uterine arteries, we assessed the way that these arteries responded to both constricting agents and dilating agents. And what we expected to see was when the mothers had been treated with sildenafil, that the constriction curve would move to the right or the dilatation curve would move to the left. But in fact, there was no difference. And what this suggested to us was that the increase in growth that we'd observed was happening independently of changes in the mother's uterine artery dilatation. So in our next study, we took quite a different approach. And here we use pregnant sheep. In the first group, we embolized the uterine arteries of these sheep while they were pregnant to induce growth restriction in the lamb. And what this involves is injecting tiny micros microscopic beads into the uterine bloodstream. These travel downstream and block the small blood vessels that supply the placenta and cause placental damage. After this process was complete, we randomised half the sheep to treatment with sildenafil infusion for three mm -hmm. weeks, and the other half of the group were treated with a water infusion, a vehicle infusion. In the third group, we didn't do any embolisation, we didn't give any treatment, we just left these to grow normally, so these were our controls. Here, the embolisation, as expected, caused a dramatic reduction in the lamb weight and the placental weight in these pregnancies. When the ewes had been treated with sildenafil, there was a small but positive effect on the lamb's weight, and this was in the region of 200 grams and we saw a larger positive effect on the placental weight. We looked at the uterine arteries as we did uh, for the mice, and again, no difference in the way that these arteries either constricted or dilated. Where we did see differences were changes in the blood flow from the lamb to the placenta. So just as in human pregnancy, we were able to do ultrasound measurements of blood flow in these, in these sheep, and we measured the umbilical cord blood flow. What this tells us about is resistance to blood flow through the placenta. And in normal healthy pregnancy, in both ewes and in women, we see a reduction in resistance to blood flow as the pregnancy advances. This is exactly what we saw in our control group. However, when there is placental disease, such as in the case of fetal growth restriction, as a pregnancy progresses, we get a plateau and an increase in resistance to flow. And this is what we saw in our embolised group. However, if the mothers had been treated with sildenafil, there was a fall in resistance, an intermediate to the other two groups, and this suggested that sildenafil was somehow reducing placental resistance. So in combination with the mice work, both our studies have shown an increase in fetal growth of sildenafil, but in both cases, the changes have not been due to changes in the mother's uterine artery dilatation. Instead, our work suggests that perhaps sildenafil causes changes in placental growth or even placental structure. <coughs> so finally, what about in humans? Well, the first ever randomised study of sildenafil as a treatment for growth restriction in human pregnancy started right here in Auckland. And this is a Strider New Zealand Australia study, which is led by Dr Katie Groom, who is a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Auckland Hospital. This study randomises women with the most severely growth restricted pregnancies to sildenafil or a placebo. And for the women who are delivering at Auckland Hospital, we're collecting a uterine biopsy if they have a caesarean section and a placental biopsy. And what we're doing is studying the same blood vessels that we've studied in the mice and the sheep to see if these same changes are present. So the study is fully blinded and recruitment is still underway, so I don't have any data to show you on this tonight, but recruitment is due to finish early next year, so it's a very exciting time for us and hopefully this time next year we'll have something very interesting to show. So just to wrap up, the different animal studies have their different strengths and we've been able to harness these strengths and use them in conju conjunction with research done in human subjects to investigate a potential new therapy for fetal growth restriction. Our work certainly supports sildenafil as a treatment for growth restriction, but suggests that the changes in growth are not due to uterine artery dilatation, but may be mediated by changes in placental growth. 
The studies confirming these findings in human pregnancy are ongoing, as are further studies of placentas collected from both the mice and the sheep and the studies I've talked about to really try and tease out what is going on in these tissues to cause these changes in fetal growth. And I'd finally like to finish by acknowledging all the support this, uh, these projects have received, the supervisory report, um, support from Philip Baker, Frank Bloomfield, Katie Groom and Joanna Stanley, and to acknowledge <coughs> the different funding bodies, in particular the Mercy of Barnes Trust, Gravita and the Lottery Health Research. Thank you and I welcome any questions. Thank you.